Hi, my name is Tim Campbell, the first winner of the BBC show The Apprentice. I'm here with Mashara and Battle, who are going to grill me about all the things around social mobility and why I think role models and the conversation about social mobility is so very important. It's a shame I can't be there at the awards, but I think what the awards really celebrate is the opportunity people have if they embrace social mobility and also embrace the power of role models and the interventions they can make in their life. Hope you have a fantastic evening. And once again, sorry I can't be there, but I know it's going to be a great celebration. Tim, thank you so much for being here. Thanks um, for having me. And to kick us off, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about your background, your degree, your profession, and how you've got here, basically. Wow, well, um, there's a lot. How long have you got? <laughs> I'll give you the short version. So I grew up in East London, um, the proud, pair, uh, proud son of a Jamaican mother who brought up three children all by herself. So from a social mobility perspective, we kind of started near the bottom, right? But we weren't poor. I've seen abject poverty and real stuff around the world, but we didn't have everything we wanted. Um, but the big thing for my mum and her focus, similar to what Upreach is supporting, was that education was a big part of our development process. She didn't know the fancy words of social mobility. She just wanted us to do more than she did, right? So university was the, the perceived route for her. Um, so she banged on to get to, get to go to college, uh, go to university, which I did. I studied psychology and then eventually went into the public sector uh, in my first job. Uh, there wasn't fancy apprenticeships around at the time. So university was the only route into work. I'm glad there's much broader opportunity for young people to get now involved into the world of work. I think from then I went to work for the public sector, as I said, in the transport industry. And that was an interesting experience. Uh, I'll tell you more about that later, probably. But that allowed me to experience world, world of work for the first time, earn a really good salary, take my girlfriend to the cinema and pay for the ticket. So it was all good, right? Uh, but then eventually I then left from there to join The Apprentice which then propelled me into another uh, kind of environment of entrepreneurial workforces, which really opened my eyes to the potential of what you can do. And interestingly, in those rooms, and I know we'll talk more about this later probably, but in those rooms, I didn't feel like I belonged at the first point. But you realise that people are just people. No matter what industry sector or where they're coming from, they, they, they bleed, they go to the toilet, they drink coffee. They're, they're all the same, right? And actually, I had more experience to bring to the table given my experience and the places I come from. So now I get to work with amazing businesses, I make investments into startup companies, um, we support young entrepreneurs get off the ground and start their own businesses, as well as um, being very passionate of going back into the education system because now I'm chair of governors of the same school that I was at. Uh, which is very interesting because some of those same teachers that are there were there when I was there are still there now and they have to bring me reports. So it's come full circle, right? So it's really good. But that, in a nutshell, is where I'm at and what I'm doing. So, Tim, it sounds like you've had an amazing career and an amazing start, but I'm assuming, as like you know, most of us experience, um, has this journey been somewhat of a, a roller coaster for you? Have there been any obstacles and things that you've had to, you know, uh, jump over in order to get to where you are now? God, mass, lots of lots of downs, right? So I think sometimes people have the perception this this social mobility world is uh, a, an upward curve all the time. But as we know, social mobility is both an upward and downward curve. And one of my bigger worries, I think now, is that in the economic conditions that we are today and what we're likely to face tomorrow, it's going to get much harder for people. So there's going to be some downward potential as well, which is why I think we have to be talking about this much more. But for me personally, there's been tons of downs, like more downs than ups. Um, but thankfully, I've come out the other side of those well. So I think the first down was I rushed into picking my first degree. Um, I picked psychology. No offence to anybody who did psychology or anything in those region. But I picked the first degree because I wanted to do the easiest degree possible to get me through university. The only reason I went to university was because my mum dictated I was going to go and do it, right? So I, I would love for people now to be picking much wiser um, degree choices and making sure there's an understanding behind it because I think the quid pro quo of the exchange for education based on what you can get um, doing something else is, is huge, right? So there's a huge opportunity cost for people now to go to university. So I think you should be really wise about those decisions. Uh, in addition to that, I picked uh, the first graduate placement I could get, which was working in the public sector. I didn't understand some of the fantastic positions that you could potentially go into now. We talked about some of the financial institutions. We're in a wonderful building here. 
these buildings were were, were 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 novel to me. I didn't know you could actually get into them, right? I didn't know I was I would be allowed to be in those positions. So I didn't have a full understanding of what I could do with my degree once I qualified. Um, and that was a, a failing on my part. So I picked a relatively straightforward uh, career path straight into the public sector. Don't get me wrong, there's some fantastic opportunities in the public sector, but I didn't believe I could be in the private sector. When I, I, I know I could have been now with, with hindsight, right? Um, my first business I started failed catastrophically. It was a complete disaster. I left from my apprenticeship with Lord Sugar and I thought, I could do this easy, there's it, it, no problem. I've done it for you, I could do it for myself. The reality is that I, I underinvested, I under-researched, and I overemphasized how good I thought I was. And those three things meant that my business collapsed within six months and I lost a lot of money as a result. But all of those things that I've, I've detailed, and there's many, many more, all of those have been lessons. All of those have been lessons that have taught me, one, about resilience, because I've been able to bounce back. I have this, this, this crazy saying, if you don't die, then you're okay, right? So I don't want anyone to die, but you're allowed to make mistakes. You're allowed to scrape your knees. You're allowed to fall over. That's okay. That's part of the journey. And I think in this perfectionist world we kind of live in, everyone thinks there's a linear process that you're going to just make it all the time, first time. I failed my first year of, of university um, and I made up a story. My mum now knows, so this, this is not any revelation. But I failed my first year and I had to do uh, resit that first year. So I ended up saying I had a, a four-year course like you, but it wasn't really a four-year course, but she didn't know any different, right? It was actually four years because of the failing I had. But all of these things, as I said, they've taught me that I can be resilient, I can come back from a knockdown. Um, it teaches me that if you work hard and persevere, that you can make it through anything. Uh, and also, the, the lessons that I've learned have allowed me not only to not make the same mistakes again, but pass on that information to others who are in a similar environment. If you've only ever won, you're going to find it really difficult to find and empower somebody who is losing because your mindset is very different from theirs. So I think every mentor, advisor, coach, friend, real friend I've ever had has always been able to help me get through those bad points. Um, and sometimes you think when you've made a mistake, you're all by yourself. The reality is if you put your hand up, people will help you. That's why the great work that's happening here, there's always someone who will help. You mentioned your degree and you just chose it because you wanted to do an easy one. Now, looking back with hindsight, what degree do you think you would have chosen or you should have chosen rather? That's a really good question. So I think if I was back then in the eons ago when I did my degree, right, I would have probably picked something that was broader rather than something that would focus me down. So if you want to go to university I, and you're not sure what you want to do as a career choice, pick something that's broad and has general appeal. So I'd probably pick something like economics um, or something maths related. I loved mathematics as a young man, but particularly because of the lack of ambiguity, there's only one answer. It's right or wrong, right? As you go through advanced and other stuff, you can have um, uh, views on stuff, but usually there's one answer. So the, the lack of ambiguity in that was really appealing to me. And economics is the language of the world, right? In my humble opinion. Uh, so I'd have probably pick that. Today, I'd pick anything with regards to technology. Anything that linked to technology, I'd pick it because you want to have something that at least by the end of it has some value in the direction of where the world is going. Economics would have been a good one. Maths is always an underpinning of everything. So in my time then, but now think about something tech related. Um, and even if you don't have it as your main degree, try and find how you can bolt on some form of tech in as a supplementary element to what you're doing as a degree. Um, languages was always good. Um, I, I was fascinated by German when I was at school, but dropped it straight at GCSE. Rubbish, stupid decisions, right? Um, when actually that would have broadened my appeal in the job market. Um, once again, if you're going to exchange your time for something, see where it's going to add value to your life and to somebody else's outside. So pick wisely. So charities like Upreach um, might be focused on, you know, celebrating people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. You know, we have the SSMAs, which is like Student Social Mobility Awards. Um, and like, just why do you think it's important to celebrate these achievements by people from these backgrounds? I think it's incredibly important to celebrate um, individuals and institutions who really get the grips, get to grips with why social mobility is such an important conversation to be had. Um, thankfully now it's 
common parlance where when I was growing up, it, it wasn't something that was really discussed because it wasn't that great. And also when now when we see social mobility stagnating over periods of time and the gap between those who have and those who have increasing, it's even more so important that we have uh, a recognition process of the interventions that good social mobility can bring, not just to individuals, but also to institutions. Because in an age where the fight for dominance of organisations is usually uh, preceded by the attraction of great talent, actually organisations who understand that they have to have a wider pool of talent to draw from in order to get the ideas, the solutions, the innovation into their organisations, those are the ones that are winning. So when you have an award ceremony like Upreach does, then actually it highlights what good practices look like. It highlights the dynamism that individuals who may not have been assumed to be winners in those institutions or environments, what they bring. And also it holds up a really positive mirror for those who are looking from the outside to say, actually, you can connect to somebody like me and work in an industry that you want to because there's somebody who's been on a similar path to you that's actually winning. And that, that winning is also recognised by an organisation. Uh, so when you look at a social mobility awards um, platform and you see a breadth of different talent that's been rewarded, actually that might give a young person a great opportunity to say to their mum and dad who may not know what's going on, this is what I want to do and why I want to do it. And that can be a huge relief to some young people who are fighting against the, the beration that they're getting from their parents saying, you are going to go and do this. And they've got nothing to counter that with because that's all that they've known. So I love the awards for doing several things, but that's a big one to highlight and showcase different opportunities for young people who are thinking about undergrads or apprenticeships and the direction of travel they should go on. I 100% agree with that. And I just want to say on that point, I don't know about, about you know other people, but my parents were always like, go be a doctor. That's the one thing they were like, you have to go be a doctor. If you want to make money, if you want to live a good life, you need to be a doctor. Every day, thank God I went into tech. I'm so grateful that I wasn't a doctor. And, and it, we really do need to be challenging these outdated stereotypes of what a successful profession looks like. Because a lot of the time, a lot of the people advising us just don't know, especially if you come from a lower socioeconomic background like me. Um, they have like preconceived notions of how to be successful. And that's not always how it works. So I totally agree with you. 100%. I just think we just got to, what we should be doing is opening up the channels into success or institutions rather than be closing them down. So award ceremonies do a great job of showcasing mm. the variety of uh, different opportunities and different aspects of what talent and success can look like, which I think is only a good thing. Just off the back of your point, I think that a big obstacle that is stopping us from celebrating our um, low socioeconomic backgrounds and leveraging it is the fact that we are ashamed of it. So um, uh, just to kind of get your view on this, how would you advise young people and people from low socioeconomic backgrounds um, like myself, um, how would you advise them to leverage their socioeconomic backgrounds, their low socioeconomic backgrounds, to actually, you know, help them um, jump over obstacles and thrive in a way that, you know, they probably wouldn't have if they weren't from that background? It's a great question um, and a, a, a very important point of view, because I think sometimes when we go into scenarios, we have the proverbial chip on our shoulder or the perception that we're an imposter in a, in a, in a place where we shouldn't be, right? Um, and people are much cleverer than I talk cool about this imposter syndrome often. Um, something I personally suffer with because you always walk into a position and sometimes you're like, well, should I really be this? Have I got the knowledge? Are they going to ask me a question I don't know? Is the mask going to fall off and expose me for being the person that I might perceive that I am? I think the important thing for me is that I know that I have been able to turn all of my attributes into superpowers. And if you can see it in that positive light, it can be a or it can be attributed to anything that you have, right? So it may be, particularly now, we have conversations about neurodiversity, about gender imbalance, about ethnicity. We have loads of different concepts. In the middle of June, we're talking about sexuality in terms of Pride Month, everything, right? So all of these things, I think, can be turned into superpowers if we believe that they are. So for me, I knew that coming from where I came from, you had to be incredibly savvy with who you could trust, you had to be very, very um, 
dexterous with your language to get you in and out of situations, usually out of situations. So the ability to talk and think on the spot was was 100% in terms of where I grew up because otherwise you'd get stuff robbed or you'd get beat up. So there was a great incentive to make sure that you were good at this stuff, right? And in addition to that, being able to talk to people who were from lower socioeconomic backgrounds in a way and also being able to talk to individuals who are in boardrooms in C-suites is a massive skill because sometimes people are limited in their approach based on where they've come from. Um, hearing my mum pick up the phone and talk the best Queen English that you'd ever imagine and put it down and cuss the broadest patois that you've ever heard, right? Those extremes, I saw those in real life, right? So actually that taught me about flexibility in scenarios and how you could adapt your your language or um, your vocabulary based on who you were talking. They were great life skills that I didn't ever understand were life skills, but actually they manifested themselves in ways when they, I needed them and I realised my background was actually a superpower. So it's about how do we recognise the attributes that we have and they may not be coming across like I didn't run the rugby team, but actually having to make sure that I took um, the, the, the little finance that we had and go to find food, bring it home, cook for my family because I was the oldest sibling, were great attributes of leadership that were never articulated or, or perceived in that particular way. So I think the first step has to be a belief that we have a superpower coming from where we come from. And then it has to be understanding how you use the right language to take what you have and may see as a limited exposure to certain things and turn that and convert that into a, uh, a, a statement or an attribute that people will see as positive. Um, you can't change the cards that you are dealt, but you can still win the poker game with two rubbish cards. I'll still beat anybody with two aces because if I work hard and I deliver it better, I'm going to win. And I have that belief. I just have that belief. Um, but if you start off on the thing, well, do you know what, because I'm from East London, they're not really going to think I'm the greatest, or actually, I didn't go to the best university, it's not really a Russell group, oh my God, I haven't got the best grades, etc. Guess what, they're going to see that as well, it's going to come across in terms of your articulation. So the first point is having a belief that what you have is what you have, and you're going to make it work for you, and then talk about it in a very positive way. So off the back of that, um, I think what you said about having a belief that, that we, you know, can bring something to the table that is even more than what other people who might have come from a more privileged background could bring is super important. But I think on the other side of that, I think we should be trying to not convince, but trying to ensure that the companies that we're applying for and we're going for believe that too. Because otherwise then minorities and people from our backgrounds and people who are women are just a checkbox. And then they, they we need to believe that everyone has the ability to bring and make changes, really impactful changes, rather than you, rather than the beliefs of, oh, we just need it to be diverse for the sake of being diverse, because that's not going to get us anywhere. There's a push and pull aspect to this, right? So essentially, the push is we have to have the belief and the confidence and understand the rules of the game. The rules of the game, if you want to work in, a, in an institution uh, that says that you need two ones to get through, you need to achieve two ones, right? Um, there is a challenge on why those two ones are required, but that's the rule. If that's the rule, we know we have to meet a certain standard because that's what the rule is to make it in that particular way. On the other side of that, you have to look at the institutions who are now changing those rules, where they're either blinding CVs, so it doesn't matter what institution you went to, or actually removing the requirement to reach a certain level because they have other tests to ascertain somebody's competence to potentially do the work that they're required for. And that is the responsibility, that's the pull bit, because that's going to attract more talent that may come from a wider pool of, of candidates. I think the thing that I'd never want to do is to create this false um, perception that all the work has to come from those who are either othered or are the minority in the conversation. Um, because I don't think that's right, because I think that's undue pressure. And I think lots of people, particularly when you're talking about lower socioeconomic groups, they feel they have to fight against the tide and do everything to overcome. No, you should just exist. You've just got to exist. You've got to find your lane, own it, and just be the best at what you do, right? That's fine, we can do that. Um, then you have the responsibility of the organisations to make sure that they're the most attractive employers in the marketplace, because if they don't do that, their competitors will take on uh, the challenge and you magically you'll see that talent flock to those organisations. 
So I think you're, you raise a very good point, but it is a two-way process. You have to, we have to, as individuals who are aware there are challenges, the world is not equal. It's not this utopia that we want it to be, and it probably won't ever be in our lifetime. We have to do as much as we can to mitigate for some of the challenges that we're going to see. We're not stupid. We're not um, blind to the fact there are going to be obstacles. But at the same time, we're expecting organisations who have the power to make these changes to also be receptive that people are going to come from different places, they're going to be different, and that difference is a strength that's going to make them better. So, Tim, um, I would label you kind of the king of mentorship. Whoa, because pressure, <laughs> pressure. <laughs> <laughs> because not only do you have a, like a world-renowned mentor, um, you've set up your own mentoring companies mm -hmm. and... Um, so, like you, you know, you receive the fruits of mentorship mm -hmm. um, on a daily basis, mm -hmm. and you also give out fruits. Um, so, what are the benefits um, of mentorship? Do you think? I think there's a clear distinction needed between mentoring and coaching, right? Mm -hmm. So, I have several mentors, some from my my life. Um, so, I have a very successful guy who has a wonderful family a guy who has beautiful children and a wonderful relationship with those, and I take lots of advice from him on that. And I have some business mentors, including the wonderful Lord Sugar, um, who are amazing at what they do in a business environment. And I know with one question, they can answer it because they've been there, done it, they've made the mistakes that we've talked about, right? So they've got the encyclopedia on the information. The conversation you're gonna have with a mentor should be very, very targeted. It should be about, okay, I have this ambition, this is where I want to go to, this is my vision of where I see my future. And that mentor is actually almost like, um, and this might be relevant for your, your age group, around a driving instructor. They know how to drive, they can see the problems around the corner, but they're going to let you do, do all the work. You're doing all the work, they're not driving the car. You have to drive the car, you have to push it. And the perception I get from lots of young people is that they're going to expect somebody to come and drive the car for them. And they sit in the passenger seat and tell them the direction they want to go and they do it for them. No. So a mentor is a very specific relationship of somebody who has experience, knowledge and contacts that can help you get to where you already know you want to get to. The definition or the nomenclature around a mentor is superficial. The bit that I do fully support for everybody is that everybody needs some help. Everybody needs some help from somebody because nobody got there by themselves. From the, the mighty Lord Sugars, right from the person who's working the butcher's shop on the high street. Everybody had an assistant, a guide, a teacher, somebody who helped them, right? Um, and I think those support structures can be found the more you ask for help. You'll find that more people are willing to assist you. And we have a responsibility, I think, once we get to positions wherever we are, working in companies, doing stuff in our final years, whatever it might be, to make sure we're giving out that help to other individuals, because sometimes people forget very quickly when they reach their positions or the pinnacles where they're aiming for, that they didn't get there by themselves. And you hinted at um, the fact that there's a degree of accountability that is needed from, you know, I'm assuming both both sides, but particularly the mentee. So, and I realize, I've realised that the kind of falling of mental relationships is due to a lack of accountability so how can you kind of advise someone to you know keep that relationship tight or you know uh, consider whether this relationship is necessary or needed for them i think i think a big part of successful relationships whether it's mentoring or otherwise is all about chemistry it's got about you've got to have a connection to the person you've got to make a, a link to that person which means that you're going to exchange your most pre precious commodity your time to invest into them and you're going to, as the mentee, receive that and give your time to making sure you prepare for it, you're, you're pushing the boundaries and you're not expecting just to be spoon fed, right? So for me in the mentor relationships that I have, the limited ones I have, because I think once again, it takes a lot of time, I'm really looking for somebody who has a clear vision about where they want to get to. And what I'm able to do is ask really tactical questions about how they think they are going to get there. Because the aim of a mentor should be able to say, after you've learnt to drive, I can step away and know that you'll be okay with driving. If I have to stay in your chair next to you every single way, I've failed as a mentor. Because it should be about empowering the individual to stand on their own two feet and do exactly what they want, but by sharing the information and knowledge that you've had, 
hopefully mean that they don't have to take as long to get there. Because if I've had to learn by falling over and scraping my knee, I should tell you how not to do that, but still get the learning required, right? Um, so for me, I think the level of commitment from the individual has to be how am I going to impress the mentor by preparing, turning up on time and doing the extracurricular work that shows that I'm really valuing the investment of time that that person willing to put alongside. But they should also be quite critical to say, am I getting what I need from this mentor? Can they really help me? Because we can have a, a cup of coffee and a, a, a lovely mint tea anywhere, right? And talk about the breeze. I love people watching at CAFs. It's one of my, my fun activities. But that's not what you want at the end of the conversation. You want at the end of the conversation, somebody who's going to help you to accelerate the path that you want to get on or advise you on a different path based on what they know and what they see about the direction of travel you want to take. The next question I have for you um, is surrounding not only my experiences within the industry. So I'm only a year in. I'm, I'm fresh. I'm new. Um, You're a veteran to some people. Don't you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but also... I had a conversation last week with other young, specifically young women in the tech industry. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we had come to realize by the end of the conversation is that all of us had experienced some really difficult conversations, especially in the workplace, mm -hmm. which you will find that when you're a minority or a woman or someone who's less experienced mm -hmm. or any of these things that might make you somewhat different or stand out, you will encounter probably more often than the average the average person in the industry mm -hmm. difficult conversations or people undermining you or maybe make made to feel as if though you're not you know you shouldn't have really a seat at the table and the question is we've already touched on imposter syndrome but how do we how do we go about having difficult conversations and realizing mm. that we need to stand up for ourselves as well mm. it's, it's it's tough uh, i think in the world of work, I don't think people fully understand how difficult it can be to be have the feeling of isolation um, and frustration that comes with that, right? Particularly when it's against a personal characteristic or attribute that you have no control over, right? It is who you are and, and, and where you start. And I think that's the starting point for me when you're dealing with some of these, these, these difficult scenarios is that you, you kind of have to check in and say, do I have a right to be here? And if you believe you do, then actually that's the starting point. That's a solid foundation to start from because sometimes when you're having those difficult conversations or you're in difficult scenarios, it challenges the assumption that you have the right to be there. Mm. But you need to check back in to say, do you know what? I've worked just as hard as everybody else. I've got the qualifications. I've got the experience. Hold on a second. The problem may not be with me. The problem might be with you. And that's the issue. Because I think in the whole of my experience, and I've lived a, a, a relatively varied life, most people who hurt other people have been hurt themselves, or they come from a hurt place, right? And most people who have empowered me have also received positive empowerment somewhere else before. And that's from a varied range of people who are male, female, who are uh, Caucasian, Asian, you name it. I've had everybody who has hurt me and has helped me in equal measure. So there's no predeterminate characteristic that says that people's going to be more supportive or those who are going to be less. I just think by the nature of humans, we have some people who are idiots and some people who are not. And unfortunately, your job is to gravitate to more people who are not idiotic or do idiotic things, right? <laughs> and you spot them and then signal them for everybody else. But going back to the, 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 the real difficult scenarios is Firstly, you've got to find and check in to say, is this a problem that I've caused or that they've caused? And if it's that you've caused it, fix that. Because it might be that you haven't done enough work or it may be that you haven't delivered to the quality that's required. OK, check the bits that you can deal with. Um, but if you have checked in and you realise that it isn't about what you've done, it's about what they've done, then it does become about how do I challenge in an environment where I may not have the power to do so. So firstly, it's about can you find others to corroborate what you're, you're seeing or viewing? So have an independent view on the scenario. So often I speak to lots of women who talk about uh, having a difficult scenario of being mansplained or over-talked in meetings or coming up with the same idea 
and then the gentleman in the room who's done it, it gets applauded. So you're like, hold on a second, I just said that. How did that work, right? So then if you can find independent verification of that, that's really helpful mm. to say, do you know what? When, when we're in that meeting, did you feel that I said the same thing that person said? So you can validate that it makes sense. So it corroborates. Uh, sorry, you're not looking for them to come in and write a written testimonial, but you're looking to them just to give you a, an independent worldview to say, is this right? Once you have that, or if you don't, are not able to do that, it's about finding a trusted person within the work structure that you can have an independent conversation with. Because you may have a buddy, you may have a mentor, you may have a manager, that you may be able to have a conversation and say, listen, I felt this in this scenario, I just wanted to share it with you because I want it noted uh, for, for reasons. And that may become relevant if it repeats itself and you need to refer back. Never sit in silence, don't sit in silence. If you don't feel comfortable doing it in a work environment because you feel that may jeopardise your opportunities, then it's really important to find somebody you trust outside of the work environment to also share that with. Never hold it to, to yourself mm. because I think that then it becomes detrimental and can become a negative talk that reinforces itself in a scenario. And ultimately, every organisation of a certain size and structure will have a HR department where there's a, a structural process to challenge and you should be very aware of that and feel comfortable yep. progressing along that route if you believe you've done those check-ins first and the evidence is clear that you are being discriminated or othered for no reason other than a personal co characteristic. Yep. But just it's not easy. I just wanted to say on the HR point, um, again, from that conversation that I had last week about these other women who've had n negative experiences, mm. all of us have said, yeah, it was really difficult to go to HR or to even know where to start or to feel like you wouldn't be ostracised mm. by um, basically bringing something to light. So I think it's really important that people find their voices and know that they're worth basically fighting for. Mm -hmm. you, you should fight for yourself and you shouldn't let other people put you down. And I wanted to make that very clear in this conversation that if you feel in a, a certain type of way and you want to bring that up, don't let outward perception stop you from doing that. Or fear. I think... A big, a big issue, we talked about it before, the pull from an organisation in those scenarios has to be, we have created a trusted culture where you should feel free to be able to bring issues to the table. Yeah. And if an employee has the psychological contract in place where they trust an employer, that should be a positive thing because an employer should see, I need to eradicate those negative things because otherwise we won't perform as well. Because individuals who feel othered or discriminated against do not perform as those who feel trusted and empowered. And that's a fact. And any employer, any finance director, any head of HR, any CEO is going to want sure, make sure that the, every employee is delivering above uh, expectations rather than below or mm. just that. And if you are feeling othered and not trusted in an environment, you're not going to do the best that you possibly can. So we recently met uh, for the first time at the Black Excellence Gala, we with, um, with, hosted by Powerlist, and it was an amazing event. It was so so inspiring, and it was really nice to see you host. I was I was entertained for hours. <laughs> 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 yeah, it was great. So it's very clear we have a common kind of interest in diversity and in Black excellence. Yes. Um, so my question is: um, recently, well. My whole life, actually, I'm Caribbean, I'm Jamaican, and I know that you're also Caribbean. So and Jamaican. <laughs> and Jamaican, yay. <laughs> um, I've realised that coming into England, so taking over from kind of the Rindrush generation, mm. settling here with our parents, you know, mm -hmm. you know, well settled as well, mm -hmm. we've kind of, um, uh, there, there, there's an issue with um, Jamaicans, um, Caribbeans, um, second generation mm -hmm. and, and, you know, so on. Um, settling in and actually um, setting up businesses mm -hmm. for themselves, making it into private practice, mm -hmm. making it into higher education. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm an events officer for the Warwick Caribbean Society, yep. and I recently hosted a conference about it. And we had a few people from Lloyd's Bank, from top private practice firms, and they said um, that there was an issue with, you know, diversity. Um, and not only um, so that there's a, there's one specific issue with. Um, diversity in that sometimes it's kind of categorizes black people as a monolith yes and so we're missing out we're targeting black people 
um, as a whole when we don't realize that there are disparities within the black community. So when I went to work for the first time, um, you know, I was shocked. I came from Birmingham. So Birmingham, they say that Birmingham has more um, Caribbeans or Jamaicans than, Jama than in Jamaica. Jamaica. So when I came <laughs> to Warwick, I was shocked to be like one of the only Caribbeans. Mm. Everyone was Nigerian and in <laughs> other yes. areas in Africa. Yeah. So that highlighted um, the fact that, you know, there's obviously something going on here. Mm -hmm. How can companies target diversity in a mm -hmm. way that doesn't categorize, generalize, um, you know, diverse groups, but helps to target, um, you know, smaller groups, just like Jamaicans, just like yeah. other Carib people from other Caribbean nations? I think, th I think the awareness that intersectionality is a big part of the conversation around um, inclusion is a, a, a very important point for every every organization thinking about it because when we're talking about social mobility there are certain groups um, from ethnic communities and also from a gender perspective that need different assistance um, because of the starting points and also the obstacles that they've had to come some of the things that we talked about at the beginning of the conversation i think when you when organizations are thinking about inclusion it's really important to understand why this is this important to you. What is this distinction that you're trying to make above your competitors? And what is the thing around here that we really want to highlight? Because I know I can look at somebody's inclusion strategy, then look at their website and see that, 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 that the two don't match up. I walk into the organization, see the two don't match up. So it's great to have a great advertising campaign about wanting inclusive environments, but then very different to hear the feedback either from a Glassdoor um, survey or from people's personal experience of actually being within there. I think the, the reality is that the, f the next thing people have to do is get around this conversation around BAME and then move away and then have a very specific, like what are you talking about and who are you trying to talk to? Mm -hmm. Because once we have, and I can understand where it came from and the catalyst for it was to make it easier to have a conversation, but actually it's made it, harder to have a conversation with specific groups by um, assuming that all ethnicities are a homogenous group um, and also alienating individuals who may be from gypsy and Romani communities for example who are never talked about when you have those conversations about inclusion who are actually one of the most discriminated groups in the whole of the world right I think the challenge for me is that we have to first talk about the rationale for why that organization wants to make inclusion a key differentiator for themselves and whether that is a thing that they are pushed towards or something that they're trying to do because they think it's the right thing and I think there's a big distinction there. Um, we recently see with the FCA having a conversation about making inclusion a part of the end of year reporting for organizations that has all of a sudden catapulted lots of people to find, let's get the statistics, let's do the data, let's find all the stuff that we need to do. But why weren't you doing that before? Where, where was the push beforehand? And, and sometimes you knew to slap on the wrist to incentivize people. I know I did as a child and my mum was happy to oblige it sometimes, right? But there, there should have been something different behind that in terms of why you want to do some activity. Then it's got to be clear that they have to be aware of the language that is also necessary to be inclusive that can run the risk of being exclusive, excluding individuals if they get it wrong. Um, and I think the final thing that leads off the back of that is that they have to get around the fear of getting it wrong. Because I think that fear sometimes stops people from doing anything where actually there's a need to do something. You might as well do something and then rectify the mistakes or acknowledge we're not going to get it right on the first try. No business goes into a new area of development or acquisition or whatever it might be thinking they're going to get 100% right but what they do do is plan use the data that's already been in place to modify those plans and be a very aware and prepared to iterate through that process they don't stagnate just because they don't want to do it and a key thing around inclusion whether that be around social mobility making sure the people that we're given the opportunities are from the broadest range of the communities as possible or ethnicity uh, or sexuality whatever it might be I think organisations have to see that the, the why has to be the first thing they have to really know. Why are we doing it around here? Because I'll see through if it's not a genuine, authentic plea. Yeah. So an organisation who's looking to diversify on a social mobility perspective 
may have to look at his talent process and say, okay, which universities do we go to and um, have our open days at and give away free pens and chocolates and sweets that everybody collects and then doesn't use that forever more. Um, <laughs> what are we saying in terms of our entrance requirements and how are we rewarding success within our business? Because those are things that people are going to make assumptions about, mm. about whether they are going to be uh, accepted or, or rewarded in those particular institutions. So you have, it's a, it's a difficult balance. You have to do the measurement because you, how else are you going to see if you're achieving or not? But actually what you're trying to do is see the individual and what they bring to the table, but be very aware that you have some gaps that you need to fill. Okay, Tim, now we're going to enter some quick fire questions for you. Okay, cool. Um, let's get into it. So any fans of The Apprentice will know that things can get quite te tense in the boardroom. Um, what advice do you have for someone who might be in a tense situation like that? Breathe, believe, and make the situation you're in better. So if you were to wave a magic wand, what initiatives would you like to create to improve future opportunities for young people in the UK? Uh, access to education for everyone. Having been on The Apprentice for a number of years now, what has been your favourite, funniest moment? Um, coming back. Yeah, coming back again, which shows that no matter what you do, leave good contacts behind you mm. because one day you might have to come back around. It's very true. Is there something you would like to say to all the winners in the room tonight? So everyone who has won tonight, congratulations. Um, but now you have a responsibility to help somebody else. Pass it on. The key thing is pass it on. What's your advice to everyone um, in the room, including the company representatives and the other young people? Embrace social mobility because you want to find the best, but also from the broadest pool of talent. Because if you don't, your competitors will be. So for anyone who might not have won, what advice can you give to someone who might feel as, you know, a little bit upset about things that haven't gone exactly as they might have wanted? These awards are fantastic, but they don't define who you are, whether you've won or you didn't win your category. You still are the individual that you want to be after these awards continue, right? After they've ended, you can go out and do whatever you want. The awards should give you either an incentive to do more or to do, uh, continue what you're doing and spread it to other individuals. So Tim, thank you so much for coming. We are incredibly grateful for the value that you brought to our community, to Upreach and all the other social mobility um, communities that exist. Uh, this conversation has been incredibly insightful and I hope you join us again. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, likewise, I've enjoyed grilling you. Answers have been good. So, yeah, it's just been fantastic and a pleasure. Listen, thank you both because you've been great ambassadors for Upreach, uh, having previously won, but also putting really difficult and challenging questions that hopefully have added some value. So if you don't make it in your respective careers, you've definitely got careers as interviews set up. So <laughs> thanks very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Great to meet you. Nice to meet you. Likewise. After you.